great. Thank you so much. I want to share with you this morning. Um, actually, that. Okay, I want to share. I want to share with you this morning a really essential part of building a team at work, but something that most institutions don't spend nearly enough time with, and that is the intentional use of laughter, play, reward, recognition, celebration, what I like to call fun at work. Now, I've been told that this is my lucky day because most of the people in this audience would already say that their jobs are pretty much fun, and simulation should be fun. But even if you're having fun at work, our goal is by the end of this session, you're gonna be able to have a lot more fun at work. Now, my company, Playfair, is 40 years old this year, and we're spending the year celebrating it. We're really excited about it. But we had our origins at a place in eastern Pennsylvania that was called the Games Preserve. Now, the Games Preserve was a center for the development of adult playfulness. We thought we had a great name there, the Games Preserve, because we were going to preserve games and play, but unfortunately, nobody ever quite understood exactly what we were up to. Either they focused on that adult playfulness part of the name, and they thought we were some kind of X-rated summer camp for adults. <laughs> or else they would arrive all excited, okay, where are the elephants? I want to feed the elephants. Well, we thought we had a great concept here. We're going to take corporate executives. We're going to play childhood games with them. They were going to fall in love with each other. They were going to bond together. It was going to be like a revolution in team building. So we did a massive media blitz. We had people flying in from all over the country to study with us. We played childhood games with these executives. And as a result, we had some of the most violent, ugly, hostile experiences <laughs> in the history of team building. I mean, we would spend five minutes playing a typical childhood game with these people, spend the next 20 minutes debriefing them, calming them down, keeping them away from each other. And what we finally realized is this. Childhood games, the ones we all learned growing up, are not supposed to actually be about bonding, connecting, building community. Instead, as is completely age appropriate, childhood games are about testing your limits, head-to-head -head competition, growing stronger, king or queen of the mountain, and you give adults permission to play like that and it is the reign of terror immediately. So we realized we had a good concept here, but we had to tweak it. We had to change it around. So instead of playing the typical win-lose childhood games that all of us grew up on, we would have to invent what are called sink or swim experiences. In other words, a game where your entire team wins or your entire team loses together. But it doesn't matter at all if your ultimate aim is to bond people closely together into a functioning team. So I want to play one of these sink or swim experiences with you right now. And you're actually going to need to have a partner to play this game. And I'm going to ask you to make an agreement with me that you don't choose as a partner somebody that you already know really well. Now, most people come into a meeting like this, they look around for somebody they know, they sit down next to them. That's perfectly natural. I'm going to ask you, if possible, to choose somebody you never saw before this morning, and at least somebody who lives, let's say, 150 miles away from you. So here's the way, here's the way we're going to do it. In a few moments, not quite yet, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. Don't do it yet. You're going to put your right index finger in the air. You're going to look around for somebody you hardly know. You're going to walk over to them, and the two of you are going to touch fingers together. Okay? Now that means, OK, we're going to be partners. So as soon as you touch fingers with somebody, I want you to shift your seat slightly so you could have a conversation with them. So you'd be next to each other, you'd be in front of each other, you'd be diagonally, and just be in a place where you could talk to your partner. Now, before we actually do this, don't do it yet. I'm glad you're excited about it. I am too. You know, maybe you stand up, you're ready to pick a partner, you put your right hand and next finger in the air. All of a sudden, everybody around you is touching fingers, sitting down, changing seats, talking to each other. You are the only person on this entire row left standing with your finger in the air, feeling a little lonely out there. Well, most people at that point 
touch fingers with themselves, <laughs> sit down. They pretend they already have a partner, right? Don't do that. If you should find yourself totally isolated, just take a deep, deep breath, look around, find somebody a couple of rows away, do like a virtual touch with them, and then find each other, sit down next to each other. So at least half the people in the room may have to change their seats slightly. Okay, would you stand up right now and touch fingers with your partner? And then as soon as you found your partner, take a seat near them so that other people who are still looking will know that you're not available anymore. If you haven't found a partner yet, just stand up and look around. Give a wave to somebody else standing up. Perfect, people are walking down the aisles, very brave, you're doing great. And just sit down with your partner and make sure you find out their name. All right, how are we doing? Looking good. Okay, so give me your focus up front again for a moment. Because I want to share with you this first sink or swim experience, which is called the tiger, the fireworks, and the person. And those three symbols represent the interior psyche of a successful person in business. The tiger, that ferocious going after the gold that won't take no for an answer until your funding is complete. The fireworks, that explosive creative moment, aha, everybody's trying to do it this way, why don't I try doing it this way? So the fireworks is all about creativity, trying something different. And finally the person, which represents deep interpersonal communication and connection, without which it's impossible to lead a team, without which it's impossible to follow anybody else's lead. So there are three physical symbols that go with those three psychic constructs, and let me share them with you really quickly. Let's do the fireworks first, because creativity is kind of at the essence of this whole approach today. So you take your two fireworks launching pistols, you shoot them up in the air, you see this tremendous explosion of pinwheels and skyrockets and all the colors in the universe, and you give a contented sigh of appreciation. The whole thing looks pretty much like this. Ooh. Ah. All right, so on a count of three, let's try that together. Now remember to point those pistols up in the air, not at somebody else's head. <laughs> on a count of three, let her loose, ready? One, two, three. Ooh. Ah. Very nice. All right, now think about this for a moment. Two minutes ago, you and your partner didn't even know each other, and already you're making beautiful fireworks together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, the second one, the tiger, unbelievably ferocious pursuit of the goal. The symbol for the tiger looks like this. Yeah! So this time on the count of three, you're gonna whirl around in your chair, face your partner, and frighten them half to death. <laughs> totally relentless, in your face tigers. On the count of three, let it loose, ready? One, two, three! Yeah! All right. This one you got down perfect already. Mm. All right, our final choice, the person. Very open, very approachable, very loving. So the symbol for the person looks like this. You put your right hand out like you're going to shake hands. And at the same time, you say in your best kind of fake New York City accent the following words. How you doing? So on a count of three, let's try that together. Everybody point up at the stage, give it to me. On three, one, two, three. How are you doing? Nice. All right, without talking now, would you stand up back to back with your partner so you can't see each other? Back to back with your partner so you can't see each other. All right, take a deep, deep breath right now and hold it, hold it, exhale, keep breathing deeply. In just a moment, I'm gonna count from one to three. And on the count of three, you are gonna whirl around in the air, face your partner, and do either the tiger, the fireworks, or the person. 
Now, the object of this experience is for the two of you to be so psychically tuned into each other that you're doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time without ever talking to each other. And no secret hand signals over there either. Huh? And no booty morse code. Huh? All right, so we're gonna do this a total of three times. This is just the first time. Let your mind relax. All three of us, all of us rather, have all three of those as part of our business repertoire. Which one is the most highly developed for you? Send that message out psychically to your partner. At the same time, be receptive to what they might be sending you. On the count of three, first chance ready. One, two, three. Okay, stay standing with your partner. Stay standing with your partner. How many people did score a match the very first time out? Fantastic, all right. Well, as you're gonna see, I'm a huge believer in stopping to celebrate even the tiniest of your successes on the job every day. So what I want you and your partner to do right now is just to take about 10, to second, 10 seconds to decide if you and your partner get a match on rounds two or three, I want you to celebrate together and I want the two of you to just decide how you're gonna celebrate. Maybe you do a high five, high 10, fist bump, little dance, whatever you can think of, yes. So 10 seconds, turn to your partner, figure out your celebration right now. <laughs> All right. On the count of three, everybody pretend you got a match. I want to see a room full of celebration. Go for it with your partner. One, two, three. Nice. All right, back to back, second chance. Once again, stand up back to back with your partner. Take a deep, deep breath right now. Hold it. Exhale. Let your mind relax. You can do the same thing you did last time, or you can change. But of course, so can your partner. Yeah. Now, if you do not score a match this first time, this time you may find yourself incredibly tempted to cheat. Yeah. Wait to see what they're doing and then do the same thing. No, 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 don't do that. Just whatever happens, happens. I got a good feeling about this one. On the count of three, one, two, three. Yes! Mm. All right, how many people have scored at least one out of two so far? At least one out of two. Okay, last chance, back to back. Once again, take a deep breath, hold it, exhale, let your mind relax, keep breathing, and don't choose one of those three things this time. Instead, let it choose you. Mm -hmm. So whatever impulse just came into your head, I want you to go with that impulse. Go with your intuition. Even if your mind is saying to you right now, there is no way he's gonna do the tiger again. <laughs> if that's what you thought of, go with that impulse. Go with your intuition. All right, last chance on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> All right, would you give your partner a nice round of applause for that? Been good, been good. And then just take a seat right where you are. All right, now, one of the premises of our time together this morning is that if your department, if your organization, if your people can spend intentional time playing, having fun together, it's gonna result in a much deeper level of bonding and team. So I want you to go inside your head right now and ask yourself the following question. As a result of doing this simple, little, introductory, playful, playful experience with someone I hardly knew, do I feel any closer to my partner right now? Yeah, almost universally the answer is yes. And notice, that's regardless of whether you successfully completed the task or not. I mean, even those of you who just went zero for three, Yes, right. You know that eventually you would have gotten there, right? Yeah. And even those incredibly competitive types who just went zero for three, they're planning to spend the next 20 minutes thinking to themselves, I knew I should have put out the tiger. Huh? Well, I actually have some good news for you. If you went zero for three, it was not your fault. Not at all. 
It was your partner that kept screwing it up every time. <laughs> hmm? So I want you to see this particular experience as a metaphor of the way work teams can begin working together. So people can really understand at some deep, deep gut level that the only way to succeed is to succeed as a team that works in unison. And that in fact, one person's success, you don't have to be jealous of, because their success is gonna open up opportunities for everybody down the line. See, I get to work with a wide variety of industries. And wherever I go, I hear the same thing. Team building, fantastic priority for us. But what they usually mean is, we're trying to build a sleekly muscled organization that goes out in the marketplace and kicks butt. Well, muscle is important. But if that's all you're concerned with, you're gonna burn out your best people. Just as important as muscle is heart and soul. And that's what this whole approach is about. Laughter, play, fun. They're not an end in themselves, but they're a way in to make the workplace more nurturing, more bonding, more supportive, so the people you hire want to stay with you for a long time. Because what does every manager in this room know already? It costs a lot more money to recruit and retrain new people than it does to keep the people you already have. Feeling excited, feeling motivated, feeling acknowledged, feeling happy about being there. So how do you do that? Four simple words. Work like your dog. Now, how many times have you heard somebody say, oh man, I've been working like a dog and my boss is working me like a dog. But the question is, you ever take a moment to notice how your dog does spend his day? <laughs> I mean, where do we ever get that expression from? It'd be your lucky day if you could be working like your dog. Huh? And the thing we want to think about in this context is this. Dogs don't seem to know the difference between work and play. Because everything is fun to them. Everything is new and fresh and like they're seeing it for the first time. I mean, you come home from a hard day at work, as soon as you open the front door, your dog is there in a flash. Eyes bright, tail wagging. Every fiber of his being is going like, you came home! I can't believe you actually came home! This is the most fantastic thing that ever happened to me! Every day you come home from work, your dog is really excited to see you. But the best thing is, 15 minutes later, you got the front door, you take out the garbage, come back in the front door, your dog is still really excited to see you. Wouldn't it be great if you could walk into work first thing in the morning and the people on your team would be that excited to see you? Well, that can really happen once you learn the secrets of how to work like your dog. Now, pretty much everything I know about this subject, I learned from my standard poodle, Celeste. And you know how sometimes you'll hear somebody say that people kind of grow to look like their dogs? <laughs> You know, where would anybody ever get an insane idea like that? Hmm? See, if you were working like your dog, you'd never be worried about, oh, I hired the wrong people, I got the wrong people on my team, I gotta be doing another job search because dogs love the one they're with. Hmm? Now, imagine that you were having a conversation with your boss. If you could pay attention to your boss the way your dog pays attention to you, your boss would leave a meeting with you feeling like a complete genius. Because dogs listen deeply, even when they don't understand. <laughs> now, of course, when I say you should work like your dog, I'm, I'm of course speaking metaphorically here. I'm not suggesting that anything a dog does is okay for you to do on the job. For example, if you were to come into work first thing in the morning and give the typical canine greeting <laughs> to one of your coworkers, well, you'd be up on charges of sexual harassment almost immediately. Right? But what's another way of looking at the same thing? Well, it's that well, dogs go with the flow. <laughs> they really find a way to adapt 
to stresses, to circumstances. And that's something all of us need to know and all of us need to learn. Now see, research has clearly shown that organizations that start intentionally bringing more fun to work, the stress level goes way down. There's an instant increase in morale, in employee retention, and creativity, and customer satisfaction just goes through the roof. Oh. I am so touched that you're paying attention. <laughs> See, here's what's so. Fun at work doesn't automatically happen, or else every organization would be fun to work with, and we know that's not true. Now, I know the Sunday plenary people shared stories, and they were really about engagement and vulnerability yesterday. Alison Levine talked about leadership, and in fact, vulnerability, engagement, leadership, those are all essential parts of bringing fun to work as well. I'm going to give you a lot of examples today of managers who've been having fun with their groups. And when you hear me talking about a banker or a TV executive, I don't want you thinking to yourself, well, what does this have to do with simulation? What does this even have to do with healthcare? Instead, I want you to think to yourself, oh, notice what this person did to motivate, inspire his or her people. How can I take the kernel of that idea and make it work for me? Because I want to start actually by talking about a dentist, actually a dental entrepreneur, Dr. Jeff Alexander, who owns a string of dental offices up and down the west coast of the United States. When I first met him, though, he just had one in Oakland, California. But he was already doing so well that one month he calculated he could give a $200 bonus to each of his employees. But as he later said to me, OK, suppose I put $200 on the paycheck. They go, hey, Jeff, this is great. Then they go home, they mail a check into the bank, they write a couple of checks of their own against it, they come into work the next morning, nothing at all has changed. So he did a very radical thing. He closed down his entire office for half a day, took all his people to the shopping mall, put them in a big semicircle around him, and walked around and gave them each an envelope containing $200 in cash. And this is what he said to them. He said to them, first of all, this is not your money. He said, this is my money. I own this company. But, he said, anything you can buy in the next hour using this money is yours to keep. He said, I got a couple of rules. You have to buy at least five different things. They all have to be for you personally, and any money unspent after that is coming back to me. Go get them. Well, he said it was like a madhouse. There's people running through the mall, throwing things up in the air, screaming out about bargains to each other. In fact, the people working behind the counters were saying to his people, what company do you work for? I got to quit my job and start working for your company. Then after an hour, he gathered everybody in the food court and treated them to a free lunch, and they had a little show and tell where people got up and showed off what they bought. Well, a crowd started gathering. First, it was 10 people, 20 people, 50. Well, there was like 100 people watching. And the first guy that got up was really excited. He had bought all these fancy power tools, and there was kind of bored applause from the people watching. And fortunately for Dr. Jeff, the next woman who came up had spent all her money at Victoria's Secret. Hmm. So she whips out that first negligee, and the people in the audience are going nuts. They're yelling, screaming, carrying on. This gives Dr. Jeff an idea. He walks out and starts handing out his business card. He told me he got five walk-in customers the next week from total strangers in the mall who said, yeah, this is the kind of company I want to give my business to. Because people like to do business with people who like to do business. Now, it's something you can do with a couple of people. It's something you can do with your whole department. It's even something that you can do organization-wide. Can it happen in your institution, in your hospital, or wherever you are? Absolutely it can. How do I know that? Because it's happened in some of the least likely institutions in the country. Financial institutions, like, for example, the Wells Fargo Bank. Not anybody's idea of a happy-go-lucky kind of institution. But they did a fantastic reward and recognition program, the cornerstone of which was they gave a $35 gift certificate to each of their employees. But here was the catch. You couldn't cash it in for yourself. You had to, in turn, award it to the one person in the bank who had done the best job of supporting you in being excellent in your job. And then that person could cash in for 35 bucks. 
and there was no limit to how many of those any one person working behind the scenes could receive. It was a true peer reward and recognition program. Because, you know, those of you who are managers, I know, of course, you're trying to see what your people are doing well. But there's only so deep that your vision can penetrate. If you empower people to start taking care of each other, rewarding, recognizing each other, you get a way deeper, deeper vision of what's going on in the organization. Then they actually kept track of who received these certificates. And the 35 people with the most certificates were invited to an awards banquet that was hosted by the chairman of the board and the president of the bank, and they were given their choice of 101 different awards. And I want to read some of these out to you because they're, they're really suggestive. And we published them in this book, Managing to Have Fun, but it's also on our website, which is called Playfair.com. So number 28 of the 101 awards, a $200 shopping spree at Carl Reichert's favorite store. He was the chairman of the board of Wells Fargo. Banana Republic. And lunch at Paul Hazen's favorite lunch spot. He was the president of the bank. Burger King. <laughs> Hosted by Carl and Paul. So you get to spend the morning shopping with the chairman, lunching with the president. Number 18, a week off with pay. Number 36, payment of your December home mortgage, lease, or rent. Number 43, a two-hour body massage on company time <laughs> on April 15th. <laughs> Here's one that's kind of a mixed blessing. Number 56, two pounds of Mrs. Fields cookies delivered to your desk each month for the next year. <laughs> that's kind of like, I want it? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. But to make it a little healthier, they paired it up with number 57, a complete exercise bicycle and sweat outfit to help you sweat off those cookies. Here's one everybody could use, number 31, once a month house cleaning service for the next six months. It's one of my personal favorites, number 61, Carl Reichert, Paul Hazen, or one of the vice chairmen does your job for the day you train and supervise. Because what are the three best ways to lead? By example, by example, and by example. Right? Here's the top management of a major financial institution saying, yeah, we're willing to get down and dirty with you. And I happen to know that the chairman of the board actually did spend the entire day at the switchboard, but apparently he went back to his old job the next day. They got every member of their organization to contribute something. So number eight, a bag of fertilizer for your garden, personally supplied by the horses that f pull the Wells Fargo stagecoach. <laughs> and again, it doesn't need to cost a lot of money to make these things happen. Number eight, a menu item in your honor, named by the Wells Fargo cafeteria. So your burger kind of lives on forever. Now, I got a, a note from the Global Service Center at MasterCard in St. Louis. And they did what I thought was a great thing. They had dress up your supervisor day, where everyone who had direct reports agreed to be dressed up by the people who reported to them. Now, they did have a couple of guidelines no cross-gender dressing, couldn't be too much skin showing, but there definitely were managers that day dressed up as biker checks, dressed up as nuns, dressed for a pajama party. Elvis was definitely in the building on several floors simultaneously. One of the departments even dressed up their, their manager as a mime, so they wouldn't have to listen to him talk. <laughs> but apparently he really enjoyed himself, or at least that's what they thought he was trying to say. Hmm. See, in every organization, there's an arbitrary division between management and staff. And what these managers were trying to say by their bodies was, yeah, we're going to level the playing field here. We're going to spend more time together as an organization than we are with our flesh and blood families. 
We're going to spend more time working, thinking about work, and commuting to work than we are all of our other waking activities combined. If we can't create a fun, nourishing, supportive community, we're going to feel like we wound up wasting the majority of our waking lives. So I want you to take a moment now to think about what are some fun things that you could do back at work in the next two weeks. When you return from this conference, and step one is this. With your partner, I'd like you to make a completely arbitrary decision. I'd like one of you to pick stethoscope and the other one to pick autoclave. Stethoscope and autoclave, turn to your partner, do that right now. Okay, people show stethoscope. Would you put your right fist in the air right now? Should be one out of every two people, right? Okay, looking good, put them down. And people who chose autoclave, both fists in the air right now. Yes, okay, looking good. Now, people who chose stethoscope. In just a few moments, I'm gonna ask you to turn to your partner, and you're gonna ask them the following question. You're gonna say to them, what fun things can you do at work in the next two weeks? And people who chose autoclave, you're gonna say the first thing that pops into your head, a word, a sentence, a phrase. And as soon as you're done with that, your partner's gonna say to you, fantastic! What else can you do in the next two weeks? In fact, that is all they're going to say to you over and over and over again. For about 45 seconds. Stethoscope, you are a total cheerleader for your partner. What are you going to do? Great idea! What else are you going to do? Fantastic! You're going to just totally cheering them on. Now, people who chose autoclave. 45 seconds is a very short period of time, but in this particular experience, it can feel like forever. Right? <laughs> Almost everybody blanks out at some point. Kind of looks like this. Okay, what, are you gonna, what fun things can you do at work in the next two weeks? Um, I'm gonna bring a bouquet of flowers in and I'm gonna give it to somebody. And I'm gonna say to them, hi, this is yours for the next half hour. I wanna tell you why I appreciate you. And then I want you to pass it on after half an hour to somebody else. Tell them why you appreciate them. Fantastic idea. What else are you gonna do? Um, I'm gonna make up some A, B, C, D certificates for people who have gone above and beyond the call of duty. And I'm gonna just start awarding them whenever I see something good happening. Fantastic idea! What else are you gonna do? Um, next time somebody goes away overnight on business, I'm gonna find out what hotel they're staying in. I'm gonna call up room service. I'm gonna have a piece of cheesecake delivered to their room in the middle of the night. <laughs> with a little note attached to it saying, I'm thinking of you tonight. Are you thinking of me? And I won't even sign it. Just let them have their little fantasy life. Huh? <laughs> Great idea. What else are you going to do? Uh, can you please repeat the question? You go totally blank. If and when that happens to you, it's just your mind shutting down. And what you need to know is you are more than just your mind. So if they're saying, what fun things are you going to do when you go totally blank, at that point I want you to shoot both fists overhead in a gesture of triumph and scream out at the top of your lungs. What fun things are you going to do next, next uh, something fantastic, just like that. And then they ask you again, I want you to do it again, something fantastic, till all of a sudden the damn bursts and you're full of ideas. You know what? I'm going to learn how to play happy birthday on the telephone keypad. And next time somebody has a birthday, I'm going to call them up. Right? Don't sense yourself. Any idea is a good idea. So, on the count of three, let's all just practice saying something fantastic, really loud and really proud. Ready? One, two, three, something fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. All right, now, before we actually do this, I got a chance to work with Abrado Healthcare Systems out in Phoenix. And I want to show you the top ten answers that I liked from what they had to say. The first one, I'm going to start a car wash for nurses who visit patients in their home. Let the employees of the HIM department do an extreme makeover on their director and HIM supervisor. This is the supervisor's idea, by the way. Number three, lottery tickets for staff and thank you notes, telling them I'm lucky to have them on my team. Number four, deliver a rose to each staff member who rose to the occasion at work. Number five, give volunteers little gifts to give to our overworked part-time coordinator over the course of her week. We're going to have Celebrate Norma Week. Prepay my administrative assistant's lunch without her knowledge. 
Take pictures of transporters and phlebotomists, send them to the nursing floors with signatures, thanking them for their support when we're on the floors. My staff barely has time for lunch. Not only will I buy them lunch, I'll take care of the phones and the walk-in customers so they can enjoy lunch with each other. Send surprises in the tube system <laughs> to other departments. I plan on having a mocktail Tuesday every week in HIMS. My staff enjoys happy hour, much like the department director. They attend happy hour at various restaurants. Even the night shift attends reverse happy hour. So every Tuesday prior to the end of the shift, we'll toast to a job well done in real champagne glasses with mock sparkly ciders or various mocktails. Okay, so 45 seconds. What fun things can you do at work? Stethoscope asking. Autoclave going for it. Ready, begin. <laughs> Stethoscope, give your partner a standing ovation for those ideas. Right. Now, people chose autoclave. It's one thing to dream up all these ideas when you're off at a conference. It's another thing to actually commit to putting them into action. So here's what I want you to do. Scan through all those things you just dreamed up. Pick one of them that you actually can do in the next two weeks. And what I want you to do right now is turn to your partner, shake their hand in a solemn vow, and tell them one thing you are going to do in the next two weeks to bring a little more fun, appreciation, joy, recognition to the people you're with. Then, after you've done, I want you to, sometime before you leave today, just exchange contact information with your partner. So after you've actually done this thing, you can send them an email or a text or something and tell them how it went. And if you get chicken to do it, just call them up on the phone and go, get your butt on a plane and help me out with this, will you, buddy? <laughs> okay, so would you turn to your partner right now, shake their hand, tell them what you're gonna do. One thing you're going to do, autoclave. <laughs> All right, very quickly now, let's reverse the roles. This time, it is an autoclave asking that question, what things and things you're going to do. It is the stethoscope going for it. Stethoscope, if you blank out, everything. Stethoscopes. If your partner brainstormed an idea that you got a kick out of, Steal their ideas. <laughs> this is not about originality. This is jamming as much as you can into 45 seconds. Ready, begin. <laughs> Standing ovation for your partner for those ideas. Way to go. And stethoscope, let's do it the same way. Think of one of those things you really can do. And would you right now turn to your partner, shake their hand, tell them which one you're gonna do. All right, great. And just sometime before we break, exchange contact information with your partner. Now, about seven years ago now, I got a chance to go to Antarctica to hang out with the penguins. And we went on this ship, the Academic Yuffie, a Russian icebreaker. And it was a spectacular voyage. Penguins running around everywhere, icebergs like floating works of art, and spectacular, spectacular vistas everywhere we looked. And about halfway through the trip, I got a page to go up to the bridge for a satellite phone call. And I thought I knew what this was about. I had been working with the Speakers Bureau on a series of prospective talks, and they were supposed to track me down if they needed my input. So I actually went running up the stairs to the captain's cabin to take this phone call, because I knew these satellite phone calls cost $10 a minute. So I'm running up the stairs, and at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, this is kind of cool doing business from Antarctica. 
But when I picked up the phone, it was not the Speaker's Bureau. It was, in fact, my wife, Janine. And she said something to me that totally turned my world upside down. She said to me, Bernie Madoff's been arrested. His entire fund is a complete fraud. And what she did not have to say to me, but which we both knew really clearly in that moment is, we had just lost our entire life savings. I felt really sick inside. Janine and I had both started out 30 years before with nothing. We'd worked really hard. We built up our retirement fund. And in about 10 years before that, we'd given it to Bernie Madoff to invest for us. He was the former chairman of the NASDAQ. What could be safer than that? And boom, it was just gone in an instant. Turns out, Madoff had stolen $65 billion. Not all of it was mine, however. <laughs> But it was the biggest financial scam in history, totally dwarfing anything like, like, like WorldCom or, 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 or any of the big telecommunications scams. And both Janine and I just felt really dead inside. We had no idea what the future was going to bring. We had no idea if we could continue paying the mortgage on our house. And after a couple of minutes, finally one of us had the presence of mind to say to the other one, you know what? We are no longer the kind of people who can talk on the satellite telephone <laughs> for $10 a minute. So we hung up. And as soon as I hung up, just a wave of fear came all over me. I mean, you know, I've traveled in lots of places, but wherever I've been, I could get home in an emergency. But, you know, this was Antarctica. There was no way to get home. They couldn't turn the ship around for me, and I did have some friends on the ship, and I told them what was going on, but, you know, the problem was they were on vacation. They didn't want to hear made off, made off, made off all the time. And you know what it's like on a cruise. Problem is, you have to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with total strangers, and, you know, they're all really chirpy and excited, and I'm sitting there kind of catatonic, and they're going like, hey, Matt, so, so what do you do back home? What do you do for a living? I teach people how to have fun. <laughs> So we went ashore about three times a day, a day in these rubber Zodiac boats, and I thought, okay, I'm never going to be able to afford to go on a thing like this again. I might as well, you know, at least be out in nature, enjoy it, heal myself somewhat. It'll help me forget about it, but it just didn't work that way because everywhere I looked, all I could see was <laughs> Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. Show me the money! As one of my friends later said, Matt headed to the South Pole just in time to see his finances go even further south. Now see, it's not like you have to lose all your money to feel stress. Stress is present for all of us, and fortunately, we're not the first generation to start thinking about how to deal with stress. In fact, one of the people who was the greatest solace to me during that time was Epictetus, the Stoic Greek philosopher who lived nearly 2,000 years ago, and here's what he had to say. People are not disturbed by things, but by the view they take of them. In other words, it's not what happens to you. It's not what happens to you. It's the story you tell yourself about what it's going to mean. It's about what tomorrow is going to look like because of what happened yesterday that ruins today for you. And in another beautiful Epictetus quote, we cannot choose our external circumstances, but we can always choose how we respond to them. So Janine and I knew that Bernie Madoff had stolen our money, but it was up to us to make sure he didn't steal the rest of our lives. You know, as Joseph Campbell, the philosopher, put it so beautifully, we must be willing to let go of the life we have planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. Now, a couple of years before this, Janine and I had gone over to France to study with the Buddhist Zen monk Thich Nhat Hanh. And I remember one morning with him, he was out in front of the group, and he said to us, okay, who here has a toothache right now? And nobody raised their hand. And Thich Nhat Hanh goes like, isn't that fantastic? Nobody here has a toothache. What a cause for celebration. But he said, but is anybody celebrating it right now? And we're all going like, 
And he says, in fact, when's the only time you pretty much ever think about a toothache? And one guy raises his hand and says, when I have one? And Thich Nhat Hanh goes, exactly. But then it's too late, isn't it? He says, he says, so here's what I want you to do. Every morning I want you to get up and do what I call the non-toothache meditation. That is, I want you to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself the following question. What's not wrong in your life right now? What's not wrong in your life right now? Now, I know all of us have plenty of stress, you know, maybe for you, you're trying to be a clinician and an administrator and an educator and a family person, and there just isn't enough, enough time in the day for it. And maybe you're having trouble getting funding for your simulation products. Maybe you're caught up in hospital politics. Maybe there's a serious illness in your own family. Everybody has something like that. Everybody has something like that. But what I'm going to ask you to do right now is to focus instead on what's not wrong in your life right now. And I'm going to give you just 15 seconds to turn to your partner and share with them back and forth a series of what's not wrong in your life right now. I might go like, oh, you know, um, well, I, I happen to live in Northern California. It's raining up there right now. Thank God the drought is ending. What else is not wrong? Well, I'm in San Diego and it's not raining here. How cool is that? Whatever you can think of, 15 seconds, turn to your partner right now. What's not wrong in your life right now? Ready? Go to it, both of you back and forth. All right, I'm sorry to cut that one short, but uh, hey, two of you can have lunch together and finish it up then. <laughs> Notice how good you're feeling about yourself right now. Notice how good you're feeling about your partner. See, pain and suffering are not inherent in any situation. We bring that and layer it on it. How do we learn to focus on the good? Well, I was faced with exactly that question during the Madoff time. I, obviously, I had to go back to work. I had to earn as much as I possibly could. But how was it possible for me to talk about joy and play and fun and fun when I was feeling so miserable? And I think my, my healing was really accelerated by looking inside and seeing that the nature of human beings, I really believe, is positive, joyful, expressive, moving to the light, and even in the most difficult situations, we can find a way to get in touch with that part of us that is really ready for opening and ripening and healing. Now, my wife Janine is a writer, and she was working on her new book called Women, Food, and God. I was working on some new programs. We were actually busted and broke, but we were really excited about our lives. We were full of life energy. You know, things were looking pretty bright for us. We didn't need to have some fairy godmother come along and wave her magic wand, but that's exactly what did happen. Oprah read Janine's book, and she totally loved it. And she wrote it about it in O Magazine and said, I'm telling everyone to read it now. Well, obviously, people started buying the book. And then Oprah had Janine on and devoted an entire, entire show to the book. Then three months later, she devoted a second entire show to the book. And as a result, Women, Food, and God spent 36 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah. Mm. Mm. My greatest accomplishment, I married well. <laughs> so we were in the amazing position of having lost all our money and about in a year and a half having it come back almost as quickly. As one of our good friends said to us at that time, well, you weren't poor for very long, were you? <laughs> but the beauty of it was that we had really learned that having money, having possessions, none of that was necessary for a happy life. It was great, we welcomed it back, but it wasn't necessary. My writing partner, Luke Barber, lives in Dallas. And I live, as I mentioned, up north in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we do most of our collaboration over the internet. And we see each other as often as we can. 
But one time I was doing a talk in New Orleans, and to get there from my home in the Bay Area, you almost always have to change planes in Dallas. So I noticed I had a 90-minute layover, and I was really excited. I called up Luke. I said, you come out to the airport. I will treat you to dinner. We were really pumped up to see each other, and because of weather problems, my plane arrives about an hour late. Well, in those days, they had security at DFW, but they would let you go out to the, to the gate. And so I come running off the plane, and Luca's there. I give him a big hug. I say, oh, man, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out to meet the plane. Why don't you walk me over to my next plane? Luke says to me, I am very invested in having dinner with you tonight. I said to him, Luke, unless you're flying to New Orleans, I don't think that's going to happen. He says to me, trust me, I got this scoped out. And he picks up my carry-on bag, and he takes it out through security, and I'm running along after him, and he starts going down into the parking garage. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. There's no way that I am going to get in this car, drive someplace, have dinner, and come back in time to make my, 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 my plane. <laughs> But then I think, okay, this is one of your best friends in the world. He says he's got it handled. He says he's got it scoped out. Trust him. So I follow him down into the parking garage, and we go to his car, and in the next stall over, he has set up a folding bridge table. And he goes in the trunk of his car, he takes out chairs, he takes out a tablecloth, he takes out candles, he takes out hors d'oeuvres, he takes out champagne flutes, he pops the champagne. We are sitting there toasting each other, carbon monoxide fumes all around us. <laughs> People are driving by like they can't believe what they're seeing. With about 10 minutes to go, we put everything back in the car, we get back through security, we get back to my old gate, American Gate 23. What he has not scoped out is that my connecting flight is leaving from American Gate 31, which is in the other terminal. There's no way I'm going to make my plane. But Luke flags down one of those guys with the electric carts. We're sitting on the back of it. He is driving like a Grand Prix racer in and around people. We are cheering him on, yelling, screaming. I get to the gate with like half a minute to spare. It's totally deserted except for this one flight attendant. She says to me, where have you been? Get on this plane. They slam the door behind me. I collapse in the seat with a huge grin on my face thinking, why choose stress? And things work out the way they work out. But then I thought, you know, this whole thing happened so fast, I didn't even get time to thank the guy. So as soon as the plane landed, I whipped out my cell phone, I called him up, I said, Luke, that was such a beautiful thing you did for me, I, I really want to thank you. He says to me, you don't need to thank me, somebody already beat you to it. I said, what do you mean? He says, when I got back to my car, there was a flower on the windshield and a little note next to it saying, anybody who could do something like that for another person must be a beautiful human being. Mm. Yeah, which he absolutely is. You know, I told that story at a conference one time and a woman in the audience jumped up and he, she said, please tell me he's still single. <laughs> <laughs> which he's not, by the way. But I thought, isn't that interesting? I'm trying to tell a story about connection and play and fun and it brings up romantic fantasies in this woman in the audience. But then I realized, oh, actually that makes perfect sense. Because an act of play is an act of love. And every time we institute some fun, some joy, and some play with the people we work with, we're bonding with them, we're opening our hearts with them, we're sharing our values together, we're forming a community. So, I know you have fun at work. I know you're gonna to continue to have fun at work, but I just want you to know the more you do it, the more you reach out and actually make a connection through play and joy and fun with other people, the more you share your heart with each other, the more you go out and work like your dog, the more you're gonna create the kind of workplace that we all only dream of. So go out there, have some fun. Thank you so much for today.